We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to, the, to our busy lives, challenged by the political landscape and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything, that being civically involved will just lead to defeat and frustration. But what does it mean to feel empowered enough to take action on an issue of concern, to get involved in a cause bigger than ourselves? Fortunately, however, there are many people in the community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. They are creative and dynamic individuals who are fighting for what is right and for bettering everyone's lives. This program will show you that one person can make a difference and that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Today as my guest, I have Tarek Shaki. He's a local def criminal defense attorney and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the changes that have gone on in the government recently with regards to um, immigration and then also traveling. So welcome. Thank you very much for being here, Tarek. My it's pleasure. Great to see you again, and um, I'm really glad. Um, I want to know a little bit about the work that you're doing. But first of all, why, you know, you had plenty of opportunities to be whatever you wanted, I would imagine. Why criminal defense, and why being an attorney? So when I decided to go to law school, it was back during the first George W. administration, and it was during a time where there was a special registration process going on where they had asked, uh, Muslim immigrants from certain countries to come down and register with uh, immigration naturalization. And at the time, I went down to the INS office in Santa Ana. I was living in Orange County at the time. <clears throat> and we were basically keeping track of everybody who went in to make sure that they came out. And inevitably, some of them did not come out. And we had their information, mm. and we had to notify their families. And to me, that's when I realized that uh, knowing the law is pretty important and being able to defend folks is pretty important. So that's initially you know, what motivated me to go to law school is I felt like my community was um, kind of under the gun and we needed advocates and people who were from the community who understood the law and were able to push back and do what needed to be done. So that was why I went to law school and then later on I interned with the Public Defender's Office and mm -hmm. it became apparent to me that it wasn't just our community who was getting the short end of the stick on the law and that, you know, mostly black and brown communities have been dealing with um, the negative impacts of law enforcement, the justice system for yeah. since the beginning really of the inception of America. So uh, that internship opened my eyes and it made me want to be a public defender, which I um, was very excited to do for about five years. Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about that defense of marginalized <clears throat> people in a few minutes, but let's focus on the, the original intent of how you got involved in legal defense. Um, because it's cropping its head up again. So we've had um, the government hand down a, I think it was a presidential order that talks about limiting travel from certain countries and they're all Muslim countries. So first of all, I wanted to know what your understanding of that particular um, edict or legislation is. And then also how is it um, impacting your work? You know, my understanding of it is less of a legal understanding and more of a political understanding. I don't think that there's a lot of legitimacy to the order um, from a legal standpoint. And when, when I read about it and you know, hear the words of the, the person who, who made the order, um, I see it as more a, uh, really it's just a, a fascist excuse to try to turn public opinion towards an already marginalized community. It's a way to, to get political points, to rally people um, on his side and kind of create a wave of hysteria and xenophobia directed towards Muslims specifically that is really just that. It's just a hysteria. It's unfounded. We know that, yeah. we know that refugee communities from those countries that he's listed have not mm -hmm. posed a threat to America. We know that they've He's not making us safer by doing this, and really it's just a front. He's calling it security, but in essence, you know, he's feeding into the, the, race, the racism and hysteria that have been sweeping the country, and he's just making it worse. Yeah, and it was interesting. I saw a chart or a map <clears throat> of the world and then those seven countries, and it talked about um, United States citizens who had been killed by 
people of origin from any of those countries, and it was like zero, 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 zero. Right. Um, so why, why those countries? I mean, what if, if they don't pose a threat, what is, what is the rationale for selecting those? You know, I wish I knew. <clears throat> Honestly, beyond the fact that it just does seem like an attempt to uh, <clears throat> drum up more xenophobia, more discrimination, more anti-Islamic um, yeah. <clears throat> sentiment, there's, there's no good reason. And, you know, it, I'd be hard pressed to get into his yeah. mind and try to understand his uh, illogical and hateful way of right. thinking. So, so let's talk a little bit about some of the impacts of that, so um, of that order. Um, what I saw, and you know, social media is fantastic because it allows us to see things that we wouldn't normally have access to. So thinking about one of the videos I saw on uh, recently was in interviews with um, Japanese Americans. And these were Japanese Americans who were probably in their 80s, maybe even 90s. And it was asking them, um, what was it like to be interned during World War II? So I think there's a concern of um, going back to a time period when that was acceptable. Um, so what have you observed um, as far as some of the impacts on the Muslim community as a result of this order? I mean, for the most part up until this point, <clears throat> it's mostly fear. Definitely, you know, you have community members, kids who are, you know, worried about what's going to happen and are we going to get to stay here and am I going to have to leave my school, am I going to have to leave my home? And it's definitely created a lot of anxiety in the Muslim community and a lot of, you know, what if, what's going to happen, um, a lot of uncertainty. And um, it is scary to think that we might go back to a time that we said would never happen again. And we talked about the lessons as a nation that were learned post-World mm -hmm. War II and how much of a horrible mistake that was to scapegoat any community and to even discuss the idea of interning or you know, making people put their names on a list. Mm -hmm. And sadly, this many years later, it feels like suddenly we've learned nothing. Certainly, some people have learned, and there's a lot of people speaking out and protesting and rallying and making their voices heard. But the fact that this kind of rhetoric comes from the top is uh, so problematic and so offensive and so shameful for me as an American to think that how little we've learned in such a short period of time that it's, it's really embarrassing. Yeah, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, but I do see signs of hope, too, and uh, signs of uh, positive energy. So um, one of the other um, news reports was about um, there was an apparent attack on a, I think it was a Jewish synagogue, but then some Muslims rallied together to try to help on that. Are you familiar with that story? Yeah, you know, there was the synagogue and there was recently another cemetery, a Jewish cemetery that was desecrated. And within a few hours, the Muslim community put up a, uh, a fundraising web page yeah. and they raised twenty to $30,000 in a period of a short time. And certainly there are silver linings and, and that's one of them. Yeah. And I believe that every bad thing and good thing happened for a reason. And this is kind of one of those times where the unexpected is, is happening, which is different communities that were may not have always been aligned or may not have always mm -hmm. you know, been um, united in, in their work, have now come together. The Muslim and the Jewish community are suddenly allies in this work. Um, the Latino and uh, Muslim immigrant communities are now feeling like they're on the same mm -hmm. side of the xenophobia. And it's really bringing together folks that needed to be brought together for some time, but there wasn't the catalyst, and now we have you know, this bright orange catalyst that is kind of being a reason why we're uniting. And yeah. for that, I am grateful. Yeah. And in a lot of my work over the years, it's um, oftentimes we know what the problems are, but I think the solutions are more complicated. So a real sort of more specific question is, from your perspective, how, what would be some mechanisms by which to bring together the, the Muslim um, and not just the Jewish community, but the broader community, because there's so much um, negative, I would say, PR out there about Muslims. Muslims are this, or they're that, or they aren't this. Right. Um, what, what would you suggest to try to enable people to not only understand Islam better, but also to feel more comfortable about being in a, you know, a poly-religious community? You know, I think 
the first and most important thing is having a relationship with somebody. And I feel like uh, Islamophobia is the same as any kind of phobia. <clears throat> I don't think it's rooted necessarily in hate always. Sometimes it is. But I think for most Americans, it's less about them just hating Muslims because they're Muslim and more about um, not knowing Muslims. And I feel like uh, it's the same thing with children in the dark. I feel like kids who are afraid of the dark aren't afraid of the dark because it's dark. They're afraid of the dark because it's unknown. They can't mm -hmm. see what's there. They don't know what's there. And similarly, America is afraid of Muslims because to, to them, we are the unknown. And they hear different things, and they don't know what to believe. And until they have that personal connection and until they mm -hmm. have that relationship to dispel whatever you know misconceptions they have, it's understandable <laughs> that you're going to hear things on the news that you want to believe because you don't want to think that you're being lied to all the time or you're going to hear things from the White House that you want to believe. So I think the best way to combat it is to build these relationships, to sit down with people. For Muslims to invite people into our homes who are not Muslim, who may or may not um, know us well enough to you know, come and talk to us at the supermarket, and to create those conversations that seem maybe awkward and unnatural at first, but break down a barrier that really may help someone see the light and realize that this person's just like me. They have kids, they're human beings, they want the best for their family and their community. And uh, I think that's the step. You know, It's not about necessarily going out and organizing and protesting. Those are all great things, but I feel like it starts with just talk to people that you don't always get a chance to talk to or that you may yeah. not understand. Yeah, and I've, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on the program is I've seen some of the examples of you doing that and having movie nights in your backyard and having um, uh, food celebrations with other communities and then with all of your neighbors and then having the block party on your street. So um, do, you ever, do you ever get the, um, the response from some of your uh, neighbors, like at your annual block party, is like, oh, I didn't know you were Muslim or um, I'm surprised that, to find out you're Muslim too. I, I get that more than my wife. <clears throat> my wife is um, a very active and independent and outspoken Muslim woman who actually covers her hair. She wears a hijab. Mm -hmm. So when they see us together, inevitably they assume that we're Muslim. When they see me alone, they inevitably assume that I'm Latino. A lot of people speak to me in Spanish and just because of my appearance think that I'm Latino. Yeah. And uh, I always want to make it known that I am Muslim. I make sure that they hear that my name is Tariq. And if they ask me, I'm happy to tell them about mm. where I'm from and, and what faith I am. Um, so I feel like sometimes while the, the hijab is a challenge for many Muslim women, it mm. also is an opportunity for them to share who they are and have an experience with somebody that now knows that they had an experience with a Muslim woman. Whereas for me, you know, if I don't talk to people about my religion, they're not going to assume that I'm Muslim. But I try. I try to make it known whenever I can because I feel like it's... It's certainly partly our responsibility mm -hmm. and not just the responsibility of community members to go out and look for us. I think as American Muslims to, to make America our home and to make sure that we are a part of the fabric, we have to let it be known and we have to allow for those interactions to happen so that we can you know, push the needle forward. Yeah, so a couple of other topics I wanna to cover today and one of them that you mentioned earlier is this relationship between Latinos and and you in particular as, a, as an attorney. So um, thinking about, um, again, the changing landscape politically uh, and legislatively, nationally, um, the other issue that's really um, hit us this last week is this whole notion of immigration reform. So uh, I'm curious about a legal standpoint as far as how immigration law is um, implemented. And my understanding, kind of the distinction right now, is related to, um, let's say, for example, you had applied for a job. You're here, you're an undocumented person. And you apply for a job, but you used someone else's, like, say I'm an undocumented and I use your ID to get that job. Now that's considered grounds for expulsion. Um, but it hadn't been that way in the past. Uh, first of all, um, why the change? But secondly, what it um, legally, and then from your perspective, if someone came to you to try to defend them, um, what would 
what would that defense be like, or what would your um, thoughts be on um, that legal framework? So the first thing I ask a client when it's a criminal case is what is your status? And if they are undocumented, it changes the game dramatically because um, if you're undocumented and you have a conviction on your record, um, immigration will first look at the conviction and if it's something that they call a, a crime of moral turpitude, which falsifying documents or using documents that are not yours to work, it falls into that framework and can get you deported. And that would mean that it becomes much more urgent that I defend and find a way to beat that charge mm -hmm. or to get around it so that it doesn't become something that causes your family to get torn apart and yeah. then you to get deported. And you know, it's stressful, it's tough, but um, there are some good prosecutors out there, and I've had a, the good fortune of working with different judges and prosecutors in LA mm -hmm. County, who understand that the implication of this conviction and deportation is much greater than the importance of them getting a conviction on something as minimal as you know somebody trying to make a living and having to use somebody else's social security card. Um, so there are certain ways around it. Unfortunately, sometimes an attorney or someone who doesn't have an attorney would just plead to a case to get it over with, not understanding the, the greater implications. Mm -hmm. And that's when it becomes really tough, is trying to undo something that's already been done. So there's ways around it. Enforcement is becoming a lot worse these days. <laughs> and we've heard about the raids, and yeah. p families have been getting split apart because now immigration is actually going out and searching for these people that may or may not have prior convictions. Yeah. Whereas under the prior administration, it was not a priority, and now suddenly it has become a priority. And uh, it's scary. It's scary to the family members, to um, the community who's seeing these families torn apart. And it certainly doesn't make us safer. You know, creating orphans within our backyard because their dad right. or their mom had to leave the country. And, you know, if anything, it becomes a liability for the rest of the community. And it means that those kids become more susceptible to, you know, issues like gangs and drugs and mm -hmm. violence. And it's really making us unsafe and unsecure as a community when, when that happens. And um, I hope people wake up to that before it's too late. Yeah, one of the other places that um, even law enforcement talks about is the fact that if people are in fear of being deported, then they won't report crime. So you have some neighborhoods, even in our community in Pasadena, where um, rates of crime might be a little bit higher. Those will go unreported, undetected, because um, folks don't want to get involved. They don't want to be connected right. to um, uh, law enforcement. Um, uh, speaking about law enforcement in a little bit different vein and um, some of the experience you've had, um, could you talk a little bit about the workshops that you've been a part of? Because I think they're really significant, especially um, here in Pasadena after um, a young person was shot by local law enforcement. Um, how, how have those workshops, um, how were they developed and then also what has your role been? So the workshop started partly thanks to you. I met you at a, um, a vigil at the... Um, at the vigil following the Kendrick McDigg shooting some years ago. And um, I showed up because it happened on my block and I wanted to see how I can get involved and work on issues of uh, police community relationships. And um, one of the things that you would suggested, which I'm very grateful for, is you invited me to come speak at the Flint Ridge Center to a group of recently uh, released former incarcerated community members regarding mm -hmm. reintegration. And I found that you know the one thing that I had that I need to share more of is knowledge of the law in terms of how regular people um, interact with law enforcement and how they can protect themselves when their their rights are being violated, or just being able to confidently and assertively exercise their rights, which they're completely entitled to, to protect them. So I've been doing them now for a few years. I've probably reached. I, you know, I wish I knew the number, uh, but I've reached several hundred mm -hmm. folks talking to them about, you know, what does the right to remain silent look like? What is the right uh, to be free from search and seizure look like? And the goal of these workshops, at the end of the day, really, is just to empower community members to change the dynamic, to kind of flip the script, if you will, in the way law enforcement and community members interact. Um, I feel like over the decades, the Constitution has been flipped on its head. It's something that was originally written to protect us uh, citizens from 
you know, overreach abuse. by the government and abuse by government abuse and law enforcement. Power, yeah. And uh, it's been whittled down and people feel less confident in being able to assert themselves against power. And now you know, oftentimes they feel powerless in the face of, you know, people that are armed with a, a gun and a baton and a taser and body armor and yeah. all these things. They get intimidated and they forget that those are the people that are serving us. And we have a constitution that protects us from their overreach. And when they do overreach, we have to be able to check them and say, well, you know, the law actually says that you're not allowed to question me if I say that I don't want to talk to you. And the law says that you're not allowed to go into my car and my bag and my property if I tell you that I'm not to. And even though you're pressing me to give up those rights and you're asking me to consent, you know, to something that I've already told you that I don't want to do, now you become, you, the police officer, becomes the person who's violating the law. And I understand that because I know the Constitution and I know the Bill of Rights and I know that it's written there to protect me against that kind of behavior, so please stop behaving in that way. And that's the way we need to flip the script so that the power dynamic changes so that law enforcement respects us and respects our rights and respects the Constitution. And it's not all about a conviction and all about an arrest. You know, Our Constitution is more important than arresting every person that you think needs to be arrested. It's more about honoring the values that you know establish the way the system is supposed to work. Yeah, it seems like, though, it's a both and. It's not just um, informing young people or the formerly incarcerated about what their rights are, but also helping law enforcement to hearken back to that constitutional uh, framework that we all are supposed to work under. Any, any thoughts uh, that you might have about how do we help law enforcement to understand what its true role is as far as protecting and serving as opposed to purely enforcing? You know, I, I understand the difficulty of law enforcement because it's a fine line between, you know, respecting rights and trying to get information that helps you um, apprehend somebody that you think is a danger to the community. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem is that sometimes they lose sight of the, the rights of the community in and uh, aggressively trying to apprehend. I think in, it becomes, it becomes uh, a culture of, you know, we got to find the bad guy however we can find the bad guy, and sometimes we have to cut corners. Yeah. So I think it's more just sitting down with um, those in charge at the police department, whether it's mm -hmm. local here, Pasadena, LAPD, LA Sheriff, and just reminding them, look, you know, we appreciate that you're here to serve and protect us, but make sure that you're also serving and protecting the Constitution in the process, because there's no use in serving and protecting us if our you know, values get thrown out the window in the process, then what right. are you serving and protecting? So I think it's having those conversations from a place of uh, respect and courtesy and not necessarily just yelling at them behind a protest sign and telling them yeah. that they're pigs and they're bad and they're evil. I think there's got to be some mutual respect, there's got to be some understanding, there's got to be that relationship yeah. so that they'll actually hear what we have to say instead of just turn their back and say, oh, you guys are nuts. Yeah. Yeah, um, and going back to the, the Know Your Rights, I think it's really fascinating that you actually have on the back of your card. So it's not only just letting people know that you're able to defend them, but also to um, inform them of their rights um, easily and quickly just on your business card. So what, why, why did you do this? What made you think of adding the Know Your Rights to the back of the business card? I think as a defense attorney, your job is twofold. Number one, to be the advocate for somebody when they're stuck in the, on the wrong side of the law or have been arrested. And I think the other side of it is we do have to defend the Constitution. You know, the Fourth, the Fifth Amendment, and all of the Bill mm -hmm. of Rights, those are kind of our job as defense attorneys and civil rights advocates to make sure that those are, number one, known to the public, that people understand that these are absolute and that our system depends on those being uh, protected. And I feel like uh, oftentimes you get a client who comes in the door and didn't realize that they have those rights yeah. and you know, gave a confession, consented to a search that they didn't have to consent to, and by that point it becomes a lot more difficult to you know, do much with their case. But the more people know, the better you know, their chances of being able to fight a case and you know, the better we are as a community when you know we have an educated public who understand and are confident in asserting those rights so absolutely that's why i did it yeah it's fantastic just to kind of um 
move back to um, this whole notion of um, an integrated community or a, a community where people care about one another. I think your point about people knowing each other and getting to know um, uh, their traditions and cultures is really valuable. So could you talk a little bit or briefly about the Muslim community in Pasadena and maybe the school where your children attend? Because sure. I think a lot of folks have no idea that, that it exists or that there are Muslims that, who live in Pasadena. So we actually have a very diverse and rich community of Muslims in the city and two of the institutions um, in Pasadena. One of them is actually in Altadena. It's up Lake. It's, uh, it's a mosque across the street from Elliott Middle School. Um, it's a very modest mosque. The community is very diverse. A lot of uh, young Afri or local African-American families that have been going there for decades. And uh, a lot of Muslim immigrant families and American Muslim convert families mm -hmm. that attend their Fridays regularly. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful center with a lot of beautiful diversity. And I really like going there because when you, go, when you walk in, um, it's really all the colors of the rainbow, which is the way that you know, Islam is meant to be, in my understanding. Yeah. It's a very you know, um, colorless faith where mm -hmm. everybody's welcome. And then around the, the corner, down the street, there's uh, one of the oldest Muslim schools in the country, which is the New Horizon mm -hmm. School, uh, which has been around now for more than 30 years. And it's right there on Orange Grove uh, and Lincoln. There's a middle school and, a, and, a, and an elementary school. And that school is a blue ribbon school. We're very proud of that school. My son goes there. I hope that I can send my daughter there when she's ready to go. And uh, that is also a very diverse group. A lot of folks bring their, drive their kids to the New Horizons School from all over the San Gabriel Valley because not only the quality of the education, but in this day and age and in this climate, you want to have your Muslim kids in a place where they feel confident about their identity, that they feel comfortable you know, being Muslim and not feeling like they're going to be bullied or whatnot. And, you know, it's a, it's a great resource and a, it's a great asset to the city, I think. Yeah, I'd love to visit sometime not only the, the school, but also the mosque, because um, I've traveled to Muslim countries before and seen how it's implemented there. But it would be fascinating to see how it's um, implemented here in Pasadena or how it's manifested itself. Right. So, You're welcome um, anytime. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that uh, we just have a few seconds left, but um, I wanted to know what your thoughts were on um, uh, this whole notion of community building. What, what do you practice um, to build community? I think it goes back to the relationships. I think it's about interacting with people that we may or may not commonly interact with. And once the relationships are there, the organizing becomes easier. Um, get to know each other and then sit down and organize, figure out our common goals, figure out where our um, interests overlap, and come mm -hmm. to the table with bigger numbers um, of diverse groups dealing with common challenges, and, and I think that's where it's at. Well, I want to thank you very much for making the time to be here today. It was fantastic having you on the show. My pleasure. So, thank you for having me. So thank you for watching The Power of One. Um, we'll see you again when we're back on the air. Thank you, and have a great day.